Good morning, everyone. Steve, thank you, Sean, for offering us beautiful prelude music. Oh, again, you are picking some of my favorite hymns <laughs> to play. Indeed, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad for it. For this day was not promised to any of us, and so each and every opportunity we have to draw breath into our lungs, to have strength in our limbs, is an opportunity to give God glory and praise. And because we are continuing to endeavor with our theme for this year of connect and welcome, uh, we're going to begin with that opportunity to greet one another with the affirmation, you are a blessing from God. If you'll greet two or three of your neighbors with that affirmation. For those of you who are joining us virtually, if you'll just type that in the comment section, you are a blessing from God to greet one another there as well. Indeed, it is always good. Don't rush, don't rush. <laughs> it is always good to hear the joyful chatter of folks greeting one another warmly and making each other feel welcome. Uh, for those of you who are our guests this day, we thank you for blessing us with your presence. Uh, we'll have a moment uh, to hear, well, to offer you a more uh, tangible word of welcome uh, in a few moments. However, we got a few announcements for your hearing this day. Uh, we begin first with an announcement from our Christian education uh, team and Joan Pence. Good morning. Hey, that was pretty good. You guys are well warmed up. So do you guys remember Lenten suppers? Well, we're going to do it. Yeah. And, and so I'm pretty excited about that. So the first one is Tuesday. How many of you ever had a punchki? Come on, fess up. Well, we need to know how many to order. And so we're making reservations for Tuesday night, pizza and punch keys, as well as crafts for all ages. Cut that out. You can all play. And also an opportunity to, as we continue to, um, you know, grow the congregation, invite your friends because we're catering out. We don't have any problems with the health department. Bring everybody. Okay. So that's a really cool thing. And then all the Thursdays in Lent. And so that is just a near your thing to my heart. I remember all those potlucks and I bet a lot of you do too. So again, we're going to do it the same way. It all gets catered. We're going to get a lot of donations. And so again, you can bring your friends. Each Thursday is a standalone. So if you can't make them all, it's okay. Pastor Anthony is going to be teaching, what's the name of our book? Witnessed at the Cross, which is Amy Jill Levine, and if you've never read anything by her, she's awesome. So, and we're going to have crafts again. Um, so what we need you to do is sign up for Tuesday so we know how much food to order. But also, I need people to do crafts on those Thursdays. 
So anybody who thinks they're remotely crafty, we can help you out. Um, and just let me know what date, which of those Thursdays you'd like, and we will plug you in. Um, it's a lot of fun, and we're hoping to just, you know, build the congregation, bring us all back together after COVID. So thanks, and see me after the service, and we'll get you signed up. Now that's crafty in the arts and crafts sense, not crafty in the, <laughs> just that gotta be clear. <laughs> gotta be clear, we don't wanna be teaching kids certain skills. <laughs> you gotta laugh, God has a great sense of humor. Uh, for all of our guests who are with us this day, we thank you for blessing us with your presence. Uh, we'd love to hear from you this day and there are a couple of different ways that you can do that. Uh, on the back of your bulletin, back of your bulletin, back of your bulletin, there's a QR code, simply scan that with the camera on your phone, it'll uh, bring up a link to our connection card. You can fill that out, we'd love to hear from you. For those of you who are joining us virtually, you will find that link pinned in the comment section. For those of you who are here in person, uh, if that digital means is a, a little too advanced for you, we've got hard copies available. Uh, so feel free to uh, fill out one of those cards. You can give it directly to me or you can place it in one of our offering boxes. We just love to hear from you and indeed hear about your experience in worship with us this day. Uh, thank you all for those who have already responded to our call for additional help with our attendance registry team. Uh, we just need an additional one or two other persons to be a part of that team. Uh, and in that way, we'll be able to space, space it out so that uh, no one person is doing it every Sunday. Uh, and again, this is a great opportunity, not only for us to register attendance, but for us to make sure that we're connecting with our guests who come and be a part. So if you are interested in doing so, uh, please email uh, Maggie Cooley. Now there's a correction to her uh, email address. It's M-A-G-C-L-E. W-L-E-Y, Mag Cluley at AOL.com. Uh, there was a uh, incorrection, or incorrect, it was incorrect. <laughs> New word for you today, incorrection. Uh, there was an incorrect uh, address on the previous week's slides, but that is the correct address, uh, email address, so feel free to send her an email if you're willing to participate. Uh, we've already heard about our uh, punch and pizza night. Looking forward to it. Uh, make sure you've got Pepto-Bismol if you need to have the Pepto-Bismol or the Tums, whatever you need to have. Come out for a great night of fun for the entire family. And on Wednesday, the following day, we begin the Lenten season. Uh, we begin with our Ash Wednesday worship service. We're inviting you to be a part of the 2023 Lenten season beginning with Ash Wednesday service here at the church at 7 p.m. Uh, there will be the imposition of ashes at the conclusion of the service. Uh, we will not be doing drive up ashes this year. Uh, the last few years, we didn't have that number of folks coming through to benefit from that. So all, all of those who want to participate, feel free to come on out seven o'clock on Wednesday of this week. Lastly, friends, our coffee hour is a great opportunity to get to know one another and especially to get to know our guests. If you have a guest sitting near or next to you, uh, do us the kindness of extending that gift of hospitality, inviting them to join you down in Wesley Hall for our coffee hour that you might introduce them to some other folks in this community of faith that they might become a part of our extended family of folks who are regular attenders here. With that, we prepare ourselves to move forward and to worship this day, friends, with that wonderful hymn. We'll understand it better by and by, number 525 in the hymnal. We'll understand it better by and by, number 525 in the hymnal. For those of you who are joining us virtually, you'll see those lyrics appear on your screen momentarily.
morning. morning. Join with me in the opening prayer printed in your bulletin. God, who has breathed life into each of us, we have gathered to be refreshed by your presence and challenged by your word. Help us to empty ourselves of all things that seek to compete with you for our attention. Help us to offer the very best of ourselves as we worship you this day. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 4 or 14 through 30. And the scripture tells us the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery to the sight of the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled within your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to the widow at Sepharath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except for Nanaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite the children to come up and while we greet them and teach them the most important lesson. God loves me all the time. God loves me all the time. Come on down. I'm going to have you sit on these steps up there. Actually, no, let's do this. Let's go up here even farther. Because we're going to do a little... Um, sermon series here, okay, about our windows. You look at those every week when you come here, right? All right. So we're going to start with the one on the right because he was the earliest. That's John the Baptist. Anybody heard of, everybody heard of John the Baptist? Ah, okay. So even before John the Baptist, there was a prophet, Isaiah, and he foretold that someone was going to come crying in the wilderness and would announce the coming of God's glory. And so that was hundreds of years before. But John, ba John the Baptist began his ministry in the desert, crying that someone very powerful was coming. Now John was a little weird. He ate locusts. 
and honey. Now, I get the honey, but I don't know about the locusts. You know, they're kind of like grasshoppers, and it doesn't sound very good, right? But he was a little strange. But he walked through the wilderness proclaiming that someone great was coming, was going to announce the coming of Jesus. But people didn't know who Jesus was or that he was coming or why or any of that. And so I thought this morning we might wonder what we would do if someone came and told us someone important was coming. How would we prepare? If President Biden was coming to Farmington, what do you think we'd do? What? Clean the streets, maybe. Organize safety, right? We do a lot of things to make big preparations. But John, that isn't what John was talking about. John was talking about preparing our hearts for Jesus. And so it's important to remember what John taught us. John taught us that caring for each other and being friends and loving each other was how we prepare for Jesus. We, didn't, we don't have to get all dressed up. We don't have to do anything to make ourselves look special. Instead, to prepare our hearts for Jesus, we need to love each other, have a good time, <laughs> and um, prepare for the coming of Christ. So that one, that one, John the Baptist is the one who taught us, who told us that Jesus was coming and that we were to prepare for that coming and that the way we did that was to care for each other. You know what else? Does anybody know why John the Baptist is called John the Baptist? What? He baptized people. Do you know who he baptized? The most important per person he baptized. God and Jesus. That's right. John the Baptist is the one who baptized Jesus. Can you imagine the honor of being the one to baptize Jesus? And um, Jesus asked him to baptize him. And indeed, John said, well, I, I can't baptize you. You're too important. And Jesus said, no, no, it's important that I be baptized as well. And so Jesus was making himself much like everyone else. So John the Baptist is one of the founders of our faith. That's why he's important and in that window. And it's important for uh, us to remember that to prepare for the coming of Jesus, we prepare our hearts and minds and love each other, care for each other, and care for God's world. <laughs> like that. <laughs> They're wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to invite us to pray now. Dear God, thank you for John. Thank you for showing us the way. Help us to understand our baptism and to prepare our hearts for Christ. In the name of God, we pray. Amen. All right, here we are, off to choir. Let's go to Sunday school.
Thank you, Sean, and thank you all of you. The, this morning, friends, our theme is very simple. That was yesterday. That was yesterday. For our virtual worships, if you'll type that in the comment section, that was yesterday. If you're sharing on Facebook or on your Instagram, type in, that was yesterday. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we move forward into this time of impartation, where you can impart to us, speak to us, offer us your word of encouragement and instruction, that we open ourselves to you fully, that you might use us as beacons of hope and transformation for the world. I now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, gives glory to you. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. Do you happen to know someone who likes living in the past? They always bring up high school or college like it was yesterday, although it's been 15 or 20 or in some cases 30 or 40 years. People who always bring up your past mistakes, how much you used to weigh, what you used to be like, how often you used to be, or the person you used to be before you got serious about your relationship with Christ. People of faith and faith communities also fall into those patterns of remembering and, and fouling themselves, reliving or trying to relive the past. Some yearn for a time where things were simpler, or at least they thought were simpler where there wasn't as much technology, there wasn't as much things to do, although they don't often realize or want to sacrifice the air conditioning that they put in their sanctuaries. Others long for days where all they had to do was open the doors and people seemed to rush in and the church was packed, although they often complained about people sitting in their seats and being too close to them. So why do some people in some churches live in the past? I'm glad you asked that question. You always ask good questions. People in churches choose to live in the past because the present circumstances challenges us to adapt in ways that are unfamiliar and uncomfortable. People in churches choose to live in the past because our present circumstances challenge us to adapt in ways that are unfamiliar and uncomfortable. So we create this romanticized vision and version of our past, only highlighting the positives while negating all of the negative history in order to paint a picture of our past that is so much better than our present and has, is so much better than what a future could be that we find ourselves forever gazing backwards without moving forward. If you've ever watched any kind of a horror movie, you understand the danger of moving forward while looking back. Inevitably, at some point, there's a screaming person, ah! Ah, they're running forward, but what do they do? They look back and inevitably they trip over a rock, a stone, their own feet. And whoever the villain is rushes up upon them, although they've been walking steady and slow and they've been running. I've been able to figure out the, 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 chemistry, the, the figures of how can you walk and catch up with them. Anyway, <laughs> when we walk forward and look back, we find ourselves not having forward momentum, not focusing on what we need to right in front of us. There is a wonderful commercial that we see now that there are huddled people together and they're, they're saying to themselves, we need to get out of here. Well, let's go hide behind the chainsaws. No, how about we just get in the running car? No, that's not smart. Indeed, when we focus on what's behind us and romanticize what's behind us, it limits our ability to move forward with what God has in front of us. In our text, we find Jesus dealing with people who wanted to live in the past. Christ has returned to his hometown of Nazareth after having some time in the wilderness, out of him being empowered by the Holy Spirit and then coming out ready in order to serve and to be in ministry. He goes to Capernaum, does some miracles there. Word starts to spread, but there's this Jesus from Nazareth. You know, Nazareth, nobody good comes out of Nazareth. This Jesus of Nazareth is doing some wonderful things. And the people at Nazareth have heard this and they're saying to themselves, and I can imagine that they were peppering John, Joseph and Mary, when your son coming home, when your son coming home, you know, some of our relatives, when your daughter coming back, they've been up at school, they've been away for so long. When did they coming back? When are they coming back? And they're peppering him with this, when is he coming back? When is he coming back? So that we can see him do the stuff he's been doing other places here. I can imagine that Jesus was a peculiar child. Indeed, walking around with a sense of, I know who I am, and at the same time, I'm a kid. 
I can imagine the perplexity that Joseph and Mary had of knowing we've got the Son of God, but at the same time, we've got a little boy that we've got to raise. When he leaves Nazareth, I'm sure that there were people who doubted that he would ever amount to anything because, again, he was Joseph's son. How much could a carpenter's son really do to change the world? And I imagine their surprise as they started to hear the rumors and stories about what Jesus had done in other places. And as Jesus comes back to Nazareth, they're excited, they're happy to see Jesus do what he's done other places. Not because they're happy to see Jesus, but because they're ready to see the magic stuff happen. So he goes to the synagogue, as was his custom. He's selected to read that day's scripture. Uh, Susan, you did a wonderful job with a very lengthy scripture. He finds and opens the scroll of Isaiah to the place that has been marked, and he reads out loud, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he's empowered me to proclaim freedom to the captives. The year of the Lord's favor, he rolls up the scroll and sits down, and everyone's looking at him, staring at him, waiting to see when he's going to do that magic stuff, that miracle stuff. We're, we're waiting and anticipating you doing that, what you've done in other places. And what he does is he proclaims himself ready for ministry. This day, in your hearing, this text has been fulfilled. And as they're hearing this, it's a peculiar response. We have that same response from those folks around us who love living in the past. They ask the question, is this not Joseph's son? This isn't the son of a dignitary. This isn't the son of some intellectual. This isn't the son of someone that we hold in high regard. This is a carpenter's son. He's probably just a few shades higher than being a shepherd's son. Isn't this Joseph's son? Indeed, there are people around us who always want to remember how you used to be and what you used to be. There's a great gift of wisdom that our United Methodist denomination has and not appointing us to go back to our home churches. Because every time I go back to my home church, the folks there, the ones who are still left who remember, oh, it's so wonderful to see you. It's so great to see you. You remember when you were eight years old and the church Christmas pageant? You remember right on that stage right there, you and your brother. And the stories go on and on from when I was six, from when I was seven to when I was eight to when I was 11 and 12 and 13 and 16 being an acolyte wearing a chaplice, although I was about this size, a little thinner, a lot more spelt. Uh, you can imagine wearing the white little chaplice looking like a muscle shirt. And all they saw was Anthony, the one they grew up with. Not Reverend Dr. Anthony Hood, who's gone to seminary, who's got a master's degree, who went on and got a doctorate degree. All they could see was, isn't this Norma Hood's son? Which brings us to point two, friends. Sometimes people have a narrative or an image and a view of us that they're unwilling to change because it requires them to reexamine their lives and choices. Some people live in the past and want to keep us living in the past because they have a view of us, an image of us that they are unwilling to change because it requires them to look at themselves, to re-examine their own lives and choices. And so instead of doing that, they'd rather keep you in the image of who you used to be, remembering you as you were as opposed to who you are now. Jesus stands up. It says, this day, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. People are wondering what's going on. Someone even says to themselves, isn't this Joseph's son? And then Jesus has a moment like many of us has. Oh, y'all want to start asking some stupid questions. Well, not stupid questions. There are no stupid questions, just people who don't necessarily know that they don't have the right question. <laughs> so then he goes on and says, oh, surely you're going to say, physician, heal yourself. If you're such a good doctor, why are you sick? Oh, do hear what we've seen you do in other places. That's what you were waiting for. That's why your eyes are fixed on me. You're not here to celebrate the fact that I'm moving into ministry, getting ready to change the world. You want to see me do that magic stuff that I've done other places. You're not here to celebrate who I've become. You're only here to get something from me, but you still look at me as, isn't that Joseph and Mary's boy? So how do we keep from being drowned into living in the past with those who like to live in the past? Glad you asked that question. Jesus highlights three perspectives and principles, characteristics that we need in order to keep ourselves firmly rooted in our present and those who we are becoming. The first 
You have to know who you are in God and what God's purpose is for your life. In verse 14, it says very clearly, Jesus filled with the power of the Holy Spirit returns to Galilee. Jesus has had a 40 day and 40 night experience where he's been trained and learned all the things that he needs to learn to get empowered for the things that he's about to do over these next three years. He comes out of the wilderness fully aware of who he is and what his purpose is. And we are able to move beyond those who keep us trapped in the past by knowing exactly who we are and whose we are. When you know exactly where you're going, when you know the place that you find yourself, you can't be drawn back into those past experiences or those past images of yourself. You're able to say that was yesterday. Jesus was clear who he was and what God's purpose was for his life. And so he walked with a certain confidence and assurance. That's why he gets up in the temple and he says, y'all are looking at me for the wrong reason. Oh, if you knew who was standing before you right now. Oh, if you understood the great gift that you have, have been part of what was a part of my rearing, you would understand the benefit of what you have. Number two, we must spend time nurturing the relationship with the one who gives us purpose. Jesus regularly spends time in the temple. It says when he comes to Nazareth, he goes into the synagogue as was his custom. This wasn't just a special day. This wasn't a special procurement. This wasn't because I just got home and so we're going to go to church as a family. This was his custom. This was a part of what he normally did so that he could commune with God. So that he would nurture his relationship. So that he would always have in his ear the voice of God reminding him who he was and what his purpose was. So that no matter what the voices around him said, no matter what the detractors said, no matter how much dissent there was around him, he constantly had God's voice in his ear saying, don't worry about it, son. You know who you are and whose you are. The greatest gift that you ever have as a young person is you, when you have that startling, hor horrific moment when you realize your parents were right because you find yourself saying exactly what they said. I was a junior in college and I found myself talking to a friend of mine who was going through a struggle and the phrase came out of my mouth before I recognized it and as soon as I recognized it, I had to pause and he thought something had happened. I said, no, 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 I'm having a moment because I just realized my mom was right. That all of the things that she had been telling me got sunk into the main somewhere that, that it starts to bubble up and now it comes out as wisdom for you in this moment. Indeed, spending time with the one who offers us that reminder of who we are is important. That's why those of you whose parents aren't with you today, you can still hear their voice as loud and as clear as if they were sitting next to you today. Jesus had probably heard and read scripture in the temple before, but this day was an opportunity for him to proclaim exactly who he was and what he had come to do. Number three, we must have a tangible change from who you used to be. Indeed, for us to keep from living in the past, something different has to happen. Something has to have been changed. I've told you before, the greatest compliment that I've got in my whole life in ministry was when one of my high school friends looked at me and said, something different about you. I, will, I heard that you, were, you had become a preacher and I had to see it for myself because I remember what you used to be like in high school. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation and redemption and forgiveness. I remember what it was like. I remember how you used to be. And, and now I can see that there's something different about you. And I just praise God. I wasn't offended by it because that was a reminder that indeed the process that I had been on has come full circle. Not that I was doing it deliberately to say I need to change who I am so that when I make, meet my high school friends again or the folks that I used to go to in high school, they could see something different. But, but no, I did it because I recognized who God was calling me to be, what God was calling me to do. And so some things had to change. I couldn't be the same 15, 16, 17 year old. And many of you are not the same 15, 16, 17 year old, the 20 to 25 or 30 year old, the 40 to 50 to 60 year old that you used to be. Something different has happened. At least we hope so. That's the purpose of coming to this place each and every week, that you ought to leave better than when you came. You ought to leave different than when you came. People ought to see a transformation in you and be able to find hope and strength for themselves. That's the great invitation that we offer to others with a transformed and changed life so that we can say, as that person said to me, I know if God can do something for you, God can certainly do something for me. 
So we remind ourselves and we remind those around us who keep us or try to keep us living in the past that that was yesterday. I'm no longer that person. I've become something different. I'm growing and maturing, consistently moving forward with what God would have me to do. I am understanding who I am and whose I am and the direction that I'm going. And I understand because I'm nurturing and spending time with God, hearing God remind me of the great things that I've yet to accomplish. Yes, I have not come to the place where I need to be, but I am no longer who I used to be. That was yesterday. And we must embrace where God is taking us today. But that indeed, friends, is the challenge. Because yesterday is familiar and comfortable. Who we used to be and what we used to do is so much easier to do than to adapt to the changes that are in front of us to prepare us for where we're going in the future. But indeed, when we yield ourselves to the process of transformation, when we yield ourselves to the process of maturing, there's some things that happen that are for our greatest benefit. I'll leave you with this last analogy, friends. Again, the greatest gift that I remember is the birth of my daughter, Ayana. And there were certain places and points that, that had great transition for her. The, the first time we sat her in a high chair and she started moving from milk to, to baby food and, and we fed her some, some mashed up sweet potatoes and she did the yeah, this is good stuff. And we tried some peas and she did the, no, we're not going to do that. And then the day she started getting her first teeth and she realized that I can eat something different because daddy was eating a hamburger and she said, I want to have a piece of that. So I broke her off a little piece of the hamburger and she put it in her mouth and instead of squishing it with her tongue, she said, these teeth thing are working. And as more teeth began to grow in and she moved away from baby food in order to get more solid food, we had this process of watching her grow and to develop. So now we've got a 14-year-old getting ready to go to college, high school. <laughs> I'm having some moments, y'all. <laughs> but that's the process. No one expects a 14-year-old to still be eating baby food. No one looks for us to Continue that little small friend, that little baby girl who came out with her bright eyes and looked at me from that very moment. No one can keep their child that infant that they want to. They grow. They develop. And when we do our jobs, they become people that far exceed our wildest imagination. Can you imagine the pride of Mary and Joseph? When Jesus comes back, stands in the synagogue, and they... Say with proud, yes, that is our son. Don't remember for who he used to be. He's become so much more today. That was yesterday. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now is the time for our offering and prayer. We appreciate your prayerful and financial support of this community of faith. For those worshiping in person, place your offering in one of the offering boxes before you leave. For those worshiping virtually, you may mail in or drop off your offering to our address at 33112 Grand River, Farmington, Michigan, 48336. You may use PayPal, directing your offering to First United Methodist Church of Farmington. And you may text your offering by texting FUMC GIVE to 44312 and follow the prompts. Let us pray. O oh God, as we dedicate our tithes and offerings to further your work here on earth, we acknowledge that you have blessed us to be fertile soil from which the good news of your kingdom will spring forth. Move us, we pray, beyond seeing our role as passive and powerless to help us become a better welcoming community of faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
to the highest mountain, flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never, ever lose its power. Friends, as we turn our attention now to that opportunity to join one another in prayer, we do so reminded that indeed Christ's sacrifice for us offers us the invitation to come into the presence of God humbly as we know how recognizing that God already knows what we come that are on our hearts and minds, but it is our willingness, our surrender and coming to the time of prayer that demonstrates our dedication and our devotion to the one who is able to offer us solutions for things that we could not even imagine. And so as we continue during this time of prayer, we are mindful of our brothers and sisters who are in need of prayer. We continue to lift up the people of the Ukraine, along with Matthew and Nicholas Walter, Sue Hartag, John Hopek, and James and Juanita Landstrup. We lift up uh, those who are in need of prayers for healing, including Pat Shuffler, Marlon McCaspek, Diane Lynn, Nancy Perry, Brianna Stutzo, Ethel Shapiro, Toshiba Hobson, Jackie Brown, Priscilla Ito, Amy Berry's father, Jack, who is recovering, the Reverend Eric Stone, Bev Jackson and Martin Nadrowski, along with Monet Heath, Janice Cresswell, Karma Houston, Sue Jackson, Brian Lim, and Dave Evans. As we lift up those who are battling with various forms of cancer, we lift up David Schultz, Christina Suleiman, Don Gray, Carol Brand, Matthew Jones, Aidan McLaren, Daniel Maj, and Thomas Lee. And we ask God but on those families that are going through seasons of sorrow and grief, including the family of Kay Wolf, William Smith, Betty Crane, Opal Sherman, Carlton Fry, Barbara Piranello, Don Fleming, and Philip Johnson, the families of Stephen Porter and the family of Tyree Nichols, along with the families of all those who died by tragic means, including those three wonderful young people from Mich Michigan State University. Brian Frazier, Alexandria Vernier, and Ariel Diamond Anderson. I offer you now, friends, a moment of silent prayer for those names and situations that were lifted, along with those that are on your hearts and minds as well. A moment of silent prayer. Come Holy Spirit, we open ourselves to you. Recognizing that you have already moved in and through us, that you search our hearts and minds. You know those things that worry and trouble us. You know those things that cause us moments of pause and sleepless nights. So take from us the worry and the anxiety, the anxious heart and mind, that we might rest assured in the peace that surpasses all understanding offered to us by our loving God. Come, O oh Holy Spirit, stretch out God's healing touch on our loved ones who are in need of healing, whether they are in hospitals and rehab facilities or if they're at home recovering, if they're preparing for surgical procedures or if they find themselves simply just needing the soundness of mind and clarity of thought for a moment of peace. Be with them, O oh Holy Spirit. Pour out God's grace and favor upon them. As now we lift up all those who find themselves 
in dire and tragic circumstances, that they might be comforted by your presence, that we collectively might surround them with warmth and encouragement, letting them know that they are not alone. And for those families that continue to grieve, allow us to be your hands and feet of compassion, that they that may know that they are not alone. Come, Holy Spirit, and speak to our hearts this day, for we, your servants, are listening and will respond with dutiful service to those who cross our path. As now we lift our voices in the model prayer that Jesus offers to us as a way of communing with you, O God. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare ourselves to come to the conclusion of this time of worship, we do so singing one of the wonderful anthems of the civil rights era, We Shall Overcome, verses 1, 4, and 5. As has been our uh, custom this month of February, Black History Month, we have been singing hymns composed by African-American folks who've added to the great legacy of hymnody within the Christian faith. So we sing together. We shall overcome number 533 in the hymnal, number 533 in the hymnal, verses 1, 4, and 5. So friends, as we prepare to depart from this place, but never from the presence of God, we go forth into the world, living into who God is calling us to be, committing to the process of transformation, 
that we might become all that God wants and needs us to be, to be agents of transformation for this world. Now go. You are a blessing from God. Go and be a blessing to someone this day. Have a great day. Have a great week. Take care, friends. You have an opportunity to see the announcements if you didn't see those ahead of time. Friends who are joining us virtually, again, pay attention to those announcements as those are things that are going on and uh, govern yourself accordingly. Thank you, Sean, for this day. As we listen to our prelude, you'll see those announcements. Take care, friends.